Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the Military Aviation Museum. We need to uh, offer a special thanks to Victoria Reed, the museum's volunteer coordinator. Um, she stepped up during this period to organize all of these webinars as a way for us all to stay connected with the museum and with our passion and enthusiasm for history uh, and to do that safely from our homes. Uh, so Victoria has worked tirelessly with speakers from around the world, scheduling people in. And uh, you may remember that we you know, had a live visitor from, from England. We had a live speaker uh, from Italy who joined us on a Saturday morning from his home. Um, these, it, the technological hurdles that have been overcome to make this all happen have been remarkable. And uh, if you happen to visit the museum and see Victoria, definitely offer her your thanks. Um, all of these programs were delivered free of charge, and we certainly welcome donations to help keep it that way when we do return with these webinars later in the summer. Uh, it is our goal to keep them free at the point of delivery to all of you. Um, there is a little cost incurred on the museum's end in doing that. Uh, if you'd like to support the continuation of the webinar programming, uh, please visit militaryaviationmuseum.org slash donations. So uh, that's pretty much enough from me this evening. Uh, please join me in welcoming tonight's guest speaker, Mark Trapp. Mark is here to help take us on a deep dive into the life of Kiffin Rockwell, the first American pilot to score an air-to-air -air kill. Mark, um, I know that's short on the way of introduction to you, but uh, thanks for being here with us. Thanks for being our final spring speaker or our season one finale. Um, go ahead and get started. Let's, let's explore the life of an incredible man, Kiffin Rockwell. Very good. Thank you, Keegan. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak with uh, people about Kiffin Rockwell and, as I call them, the boys who remembered Lafayette. Uh, this is one of the things I like to do best of all. Um, so I'll just jump right in. Uh, you can see the the cover of the book is there on the on the front slide. I'll tell you just a bit about how I uh, became involved with uh, Kiffin Rockwell. Many of uh, you on the line probably know a bit about the Lafayette Escadrille. Um, many of you have probably heard the name Kiffin Yates Rockwell, but in August of 1997, I had not. That was the month that I started law school at Washington and Lee University in uh, Lexington, Virginia. My wife was pregnant with our first child and we were thinking of baby names and my first day on campus i walked to lee chapel there in the middle of campus and was just exploring a little bit and i came into lee chapel and saw this plaque on the wall that as you can see just says kiffin yates rockwell um killed in aerial combat rotor in alsace in france september 23rd 1916 and i thought gosh that name kiffin yates rockwell that's the coolest name i've ever heard of uh, you know that's what the, this guy had to be a stud <laughs> and, and uh but then i thought you know i didn't know much about world war one um but i thought what was this guy doing there in 1916 um i i didn't know much but i knew that america didn't get involved until uh 1917. <clears throat> so um, i started doing just a little bit of research on uh, on kiffin and um didn't didn't do much until many years later when our uh after four daughters, we had a son who we named Kiffin, and he was actually born on August 27th, 2014, which uh, I confirmed through my research was the exact 100 year anniversary to the day of the day that Kiffin Rockwell and his brother Paul uh, enlisted in the Foreign Legion in Paris, France. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I put a picture of Kiffin during his time at Washington and Lee there on the left. He was 17 years old when this picture was taken, and, and it's one of my favorite pictures of, of him. I think it really shows uh, the principled idealist that he was. You can just sort of see it, uh, particularly in his eyes. And um, I found uh, a quote from one of his teachers who taught him when he was a freshman, and she said this about his eyes. He had the most beautiful eyes I ever saw. I taught hundreds of pupils during 10 years or so, but remember the eyes of none but Kiffin Rockwell. So he stood out even, even as a freshman in high school. <clears throat> um, Kiffin's father was a preacher and he died uh, in the first year of Kiffin's life. In fact, just before Kiffin turned one. 
but I like to think of Kiffin at that age uh, as uh, sort of like his father at the same age. Oops, I see I skipped ahead there. Um, that here's here's something that his father wrote, and this is where I got part of the title of the book. <clears throat> when Kiffin's father was 17, he was actually the editor of his own newspaper that he bought uh, and ran in Raleigh, North Carolina. And he wrote an editorial called False Destiny when he was 17 that began with the uh, bold statement, every man should make his own destiny. He uh, closed with, with this point, and this is where I got the title of the book. Here's what he said. Oh man, be up and doing. Laugh down the foolish idea that you are but a helpless reed in the hands of a fickle destiny. Scorn the thought that you cannot do noble things simply because fate says you must not. Be true to yourself and to humanity, and you make for yourself a destiny of undying greatness and grandeur. And that quote I thought was really something coming from a 17 year old, but I think it kind of sums up Kiffin at 17. I think that he felt largely the way that his father had felt, that a man makes his own destiny and, and uh, makes his own way, acts on his principles and will make his own destiny for, for himself. And so that's how I like to think of Kiffin. And I took that little bit uh, from uh, that quote from his father, A Destiny of Undying Greatness. And that's, that's where I got the title of the book. Um, but Kiffin uh, left Washington and Lee and found himself in Atlanta in the summer of 1914 working as an ad salesman. Um, and when the war broke out, he uh, and his brother Paul decided that they would take off and uh, enlist for France. They were likely the first Americans, at least in America, to do so. There were plenty of Americans in Paris, and that's what this slide re reflects. This is uh, the departure of the American volunteers there. What, what was the title? And this was the title that was actually in the, the English language New York Herald, which was the paper in Paris, but it was the English paper there. And that's the title that they gave it in their August 26th edition. So this picture was taken on August 25th when a lot of the American boys who, when the war broke out, found themselves themselves in Paris, decided to enlist in the Foreign Legion with France. And this was their walk to the train station where they were going to board the train to leave uh, for their training. Um, the Herald told of the scenes of wild enthusiasm that were sweeping Paris as the war to end all wars and began and young men of many nationalities enlisted with the French Foreign Legion. Um, Kiffin and Paul, as I stated a moment ago, arrived there on August 26th. Their official enlistment in the Legion uh, took place the next day on August 27th. So the day that they got there, they probably saw this paper or th this picture in the, in the uh, paper, the New York Herald. Um, one reporter there described this scene as these Americans marched to the, to the train station. The citizens massed on the sidewalks and applauded frantically. Girls rushed forward uh, to give flowers to the volunteers, to pat them on the arm, to stammer the few words of English at their command. Good luck, come back safe, brave Americans, etc. Women in their private carriages and in taxi cabs ordered their drivers to keep pace with the marching men while they leaned out, fluttered handkerchiefs and threw kisses. A courtly old Frenchman rose from the terrace of the Café de la Paix and raised his hat to the American flag. Gentlemen, France thanks you, he cried. So you can see this, this scene as these uh, um, American citizens marched uh, in the defense of France was, was quite uh, striking and vivid. And somebody snapped this picture. It's become somewhat of a famous uh, picture. The gentleman carrying the flag there is, uh, is named Rene Felizo. And he was from Chicago, he was a big game hunter and, a, and quite a character. Um, he was liked by all the men and that flag that he's carrying, we'll touch on a little bit later too, but that flag actually hung over the recruiting office that they had set up in Paris. Uh, it had 44 stars on it, even though there were 48 states in the union at that time. So it was the best that they could do. But uh, Felizo actually carried that flag down the Avenue de la Opera here. They carried it with them throughout their training. And then when they were ordered uh, upon being sent to the front to put away all foreign flags so as to not cause any international uh, complications, fellas uh, wound the flag and folded it and, and wound it around his waist and wore it under his clothing 
during the period of his enlistment until in uh, March of 1915, he, he, he was killed actually by another uh, soldier in the, in the uh, foreign legion whom he got into a fight with. And the fr a friend of that soldier snuck up behind him and hit him over the head with a bottle of wine. And uh, he ended up getting lockjaw and dying. But before he died, he rose up in his hospital bed, uh, half delirious, and grabbed this flag that he had carried and that he had worn during that whole time and held it up and spread it out and said, I am an American. And then he, uh, he, he died. And that flag was carried by others. It eventually made its way back to Paris. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. This fellow though, was quite the character though. His, uh, <clears throat> his famous saying that he used throughout the, their enlistment was that every time something happened, funny, sad, or otherwise, he would tell the boys, it, it's the fortunes of war, he, he would say. And that became sort of a, a running joke amongst the boys. This picture shows Kiffin and Paul uh, during their training uh, with these other Americans. That's Kiffin on the left and Paul on the right. They're outfitted in their uh, Foreign Legion kit, which they likely just got most of it. A lot of it when they first took off to the front wasn't even uh, available for them yet. They didn't get their rifles. Their, uh, much of the uniform showed up later. <clears throat> I won't say too much about their training. Uh, you can read about it in, in the book, but they were stuck with a bunch of uh, Americans and those of other nationalities. Kiffin and Paul were put in a squadron of 16 men. I think uh, nine or 10 of them were American and then there was a Swede and uh, they were they were they had some other nationalities and then there was a German corporal that was, that was over them. Um, they met many very interesting characters, including uh, two later members of the, uh, the squadron that, that these boys became famous for. Uh, Bill Thaw and uh, Bert Hall were both in the same squadron with Kiffin and with Paul. Um, Alan Seeger was another uh, American who was in the same squadron, and we'll hear a little bit more about him later too. As far as their training, it was uh, it was rough and uh, um, turned them into soldiers for France rather quickly. They stuck with it uh, through all through all their training and. Uh, it's summed up by a quote uh, of another uh, American boy who was in the training at the same time with the Foreign Legion. And he wrote this in a letter home to his, his mother in November, describing their uh, life in the trenches. He said, monotony and vermin and mud and cold and thrills and dulling work and hunger and that gambler's happiness, which only the soldier knows in its fullest perfection. All these things enter into life in the trenches. I thought that was a good quote to sort of sum up everything that they that they went through. Um, Paul, his constitution was unable to stick with it, which was true for many boys, uh, both uh, French, American, and otherwise. And he was invalided out shortly after Thanksgiving and would later uh, get on as a war correspondent for the Chicago Daily News. Um, in that capacity, he still knew many of the boys and, and became pretty influential as a conduit between the... Um, <clears throat> Americans and the French um, would later marry the daughter of a, of a uh, cabinet minister who went on to become the prime minister of, of France. Um, Kiffin stuck with it and uh, eventually, uh, shortly after Christmas, they were th their squadron was transferred to uh, a place called Crayonel where they had they had uh, caught glimpses of a chateau from the many places where they were encamped but now they were to be stationed in this chateau and you know, I have a picture of the chateau there it's called the chateau du blanc sablon the chateau of the white sand and it had been bombed uh, repeatedly and crayonel was a town that had been uh, um, traded hands between the french and the germans a, a couple times <clears throat> um, in, uh, in early January 1915, Kiffin and his uh, uh, squad mates were transferred there, and they were to stay in the, in the wine cellar of, of this chateau. D.W. King, who was a, a member of their squad and a, a, another Harvard uh, gent, many of these boys came from Harvard or Yale. Uh, Kiffin went to Washington and Lee, and a lot of these boys were uh, sort of the, the cream of the crop, you know, college boys from America at that time. Who felt that it was their duty to uh, go and fight for France. Um, but here's what uh, D.W. King wrote as they came up that night to the chateau. 
It gave us comfort and cheer to see the chateau lighted as we filed through the gates of the park. The glass gateway was intact, and so little damage seemed to have been done to the facade that it was hard to realize we were only a few hundred yards from the front line. We turned the corner, and as if by black magic, the lights went out, and the place became a gutted ruin. It had only been the moon shining through empty windows. And so you can see this daylight photo there gives a pretty good shot of that chateau. The whole place was bombed out, except for this uh, shell that stood. Well, something very interesting happened uh, there uh, that, that first night that they stayed in the, in the chateau, and it involved Alan Seeger, whom I mentioned before. He had graduated from Harvard in uh, 1912, the same class as T.S. Eliot, and Seeger was a, a, a poet and an idealist and uh, sort of uh, a, had strong principles, and he had been in Paris uh, hobnobbing with the intellectuals and writing poetry and hanging out in the Latin Quarter, hoping to publish a book of his poetry. He, uh, in fact, when the war broke out, he was just returning from uh, Belgium where he had placed a copy of his uh, manuscript with a printer. He signed up with the rest of the Americans and he had a, a deep and abiding uh, love and respect for France and for Paris in particular and felt like it was his duty to uh, stand with uh, France and civilization. So he had signed up, ended up in the same squadron with, with these boys. And he was posted at a wall that went around this estate at the Chateau de Blanc Sablon. He was the mobile sentinel on sentry duty that night. And Kiffin was posted there at a spot in the wall where a shell had blown a big hole and uh, had been uh, uh, covered up with some uh, sort of a makeshift barricade there of uh, uh, chair, a chair, a door had been placed there, and a ladder had been propped up next to the uh, wall so that Kiffin could climb up and look over the wall to see where the uh, where the Germans were. The Germans were right there, uh, you know, just a couple hundred yards from this uh, estate, and that's where their trench line ended. Well, uh, that night, um, Kiffin was the only one posted there, and some of the other Americans were posted a little further down the wall. And I mentioned this incident and go into some detail because it had a big impact on Alan Seeger and certainly on Kiffin Rockwell and the rest of the boys. Here's, here's what uh, happened. About 10.30 that night, not long after Kiffin had been placed uh, on, on duty, Alan Seeger was uh, moving between the different posts and he came back up to, uh, to check on Kiffin and a, an object drops on the ground in between them and lands there with a thud. They look down and see this uh, little device sort of sputter out, and, and Kiffin actually bends and picks, picks the thing up. At that point, Seeger realizes what it is, and it's a hand grenade. And he says, good God, it's a hand grenade. Kiffin tosses it away, and it doesn't go off. They realize, though, at that minute that the Germans are on the opposite side of the wall, literally just steps away through that uh, makeshift barricade that's... Uh, that's now the only thing between them and the Germans. They don't really know what to do, so they have a quick whispered conversation, and it's decided that, that uh, Seeger will take off to get the corporal. He does, and as the, he comes running back up with the corporal, they see multiple hand grenades being tossed over the wall. These grenades go off. Um, Kiffin and, and Seeger uh, get separated, and Kiffin and the corporal uh, start breaking for the woods, and that's when the Germans break through and start shooting. They end up killing the corporal. Um, Kiffin and Seeger meet up in the woods, and uh, after uh, a few minutes of shooting, and uh, and uh, and the Germans beat the head uh, off of the corporal with the butts of their rifle, and then steal his greatcoat and slip back through the the hole in the wall. The French come back out and get their reinforcements and. Uh, the boys all felt sort of disgraced by this, that they got sort of caught off guard like this. Uh, they realized though that they were placed in sort of an unenviable un, uh, position by their superior officers. But what really uh, gets these boys is not that this is their real first taste of, uh, of death. A, a few of the people in their uh, regiment had, uh, had died before and they'd been in the trenches uh, back and forth, but this was really where it hits home when their corporal uh, dies and gets killed in this way. Something that struck all of them and that I found in several of their letters home after this event 
was this uh, about two hours after the incident, because it comes down from the hillside where the Germans were set up, uh, what uh, Kiffin called the most diabolical yell of derision I ever heard. This was their corporal's killers, the Germans uh, back up in, the, in their uh, trenches, were mocking uh, the corporal's last words, which was his French call to arms. This cry really penetrated through all the men and they just didn't uh, quite know how to react. Kiffin wrote to his sister that it practically froze the blood to hear it. Another soldier with the Americans uh, wrote home that in all my life, I never before have heard such a diabolical yell. This uh, D.W. King wrote that it was something new, but very old, a long wolf-like howl, half human, half beast, derision, triumph, and revenge straight back across the ages from ape man and wolf pack. So you can get a sense for how this, uh, this cry must have really just struck to the, to the bone of, of these boys. Seeger wrote this in a letter that he wrote home. In that cry, all the evolution of centuries was leveled. I seemed to hear the yell of the warrior of the Stone Age over his fallen enemy. It was one of those antidotes to civilization of which this war can offer so many. Um, so that was Seeger's thought on it. Um, Seeger later wrote his father, uh, believe me, I have had a narrow escape. And uh, I, th I think I'm, uh, I might uh, say that uh, his, Seeger, Seeger did become a rather famous poet. He died uh, during World War I. He actually died on the 4th of July, and some of his poetry became rather famous. One of his poems was called, I Have a Rendezvous with Death. And I sort of satisfied myself through my research and all this that uh, I believe that that poem was at least partially inspired by what happened there that night in uh, January of 1915 at the Chateau de blanc sablon when he was at the side of Kiffin Rockwell and nearly got overrun by this uh, German patrol. Um, because the opening lines of this poem, which many of you may know, it was John F. Kennedy's uh, favorite poem, this, this I Have a Rendezvous with Death. It begins, I have a rendezvous with death at some disputed barricade. And that was certainly uh, the closest that uh, Seeger came to death at a barricade. So I thought that was kind of an interesting little uh, tidbit. Um, eventually, Kiffin transfers to another uh, squad in the of Americans, mainly made up of Americans in the uh, Foreign Legion, and gets wounded retaking some German trenches in May of 1915. He gets sent to a hospital to uh, uh, recover, and then gets a month off in in uh, in Paris, and he spends it with his brother Paul. And this is a picture of him and his brother Paul in Paris in July of 1915. He um, meets, the, in, in, in his new squadron, there was another soldier that he met that was an American whose name was Kenneth Weeks. Kenneth Weeks and Kiffin became pretty good friends and uh, often served on guard duty together. And, uh, and you can tell in, the, in uh, Kiffin's letters that he had become pretty close with Kenneth, Kenneth Weeks. When Kiffin was wounded, uh, retaking those trenches in May, Kenneth Weeks' mother, Alice Weeks, and this is a photo of her uh, on this page as well, received erroneous word that it was her son, Kenneth. And he wrote a letter to her and said, no, mother, it wasn't me. It was a chap named Rockwell. If you see him, be, uh, be kind to him. Well, sure enough, when Kiffin comes to Paris in July, he meets uh, Mrs. Weeks. And she becomes like a second uh, mother to him. They really hit it off. And uh, she starts taking care of him and watching over him and Paul. And then one by one, other boys. Uh, we could write a whole book about her. She eventually uh, became uh, known by the boys as Maman Legionnaire, the mother of the Legion. And she took care of all the American boys that came through Paris and that uh, fought there in France. She eventually uh, secured a bunch of money from donations and, and started the home service for the American soldiers. Um, but she loved Kiffin uh, most of all. Well, her son, Kenneth, uh, was in, had been in that same squadron, and, and Mrs. Weeks had been working on uh, getting him out of the trenches and into this new, new uh, uh, area called aviation. And she thought that it might be a little safer for him than the trenches. Uh, that turns out to not really be the case, but she had secured a slot for him 
to get into aviation. He, you can see in their letters back and forth that Kenneth Weeks was not interested, at least at first. And he was, he said, no, thanks. I think I'll just stay here. But uh, in, in the last letter that he wrote to her, he said, you know what? I think I will uh, take a look at the, at the aviation. Um, we're, we have another um, battle coming up. And after that, uh, I'll check back with you. Well, unfortunately, in that battle, uh, Kenneth Weeks was killed, and she never heard from him again. And it was shortly after that that Kiffin arrived back in Paris and hit it off with Mrs. Weeks. She eventually decided uh, before the end of that month that Kiffin could take her son's slot in the aviation uh, with the French, and that's and that's what happened. She helped to secure him this uh, this slot in aviation. He went into aviation training in September of 1915 with the French. There were a couple other boys, American boys, that had already gotten into aviation, and um, this was going on in, independent of uh, of the Americans that were in the foreign foreign legion. This uh, gentleman on the left is Norman Prince. Uh, his friends called him Nimmy, and he was an idealist who, uh, like Kiffin, believed that America owed a debt to France because of the actions of Lafayette through in America's uh, battle for independence. Norman Prince was the son of Frederick uh, Henry Prince, who was one of the richest men in America and in the world at that time. He was, his grandfather had been the mayor of Boston. Frederick Prince had slots on the Boston and New York Stock Exchanges and was the chairman of the board of the Chicago Union Stockyard Company. It just made more money than, than uh, than anyone ever. I mean, they, they had estates everywhere, one of which was in French, or in France, I'm sorry. And uh, Norman knew some, some French. And when the, when the war broke out, Norman decided that he would, uh, he, he had an idea that they could start an American squadron of pilots that could fly for France and, and drum up support for France in, in America. He had taken a boat to France uh, without his father's blessing and, and monetary backing, by the way. Um, his father didn't really want him to have anything to do with aviation. And actually, this photo that I found of him is from a, uh, a newspaper when, when Norman Prince got his military license. This was on the front page of that paper in 1911. His father didn't even know that he was taking avi uh, aviation lessons and certainly not getting his license. And when he found out, was uh, was sort of livid and shipped Norman off to Chicago, where I am, to work for a law firm out here that handled all of his business. Norman was a, a Harvard-trained lawyer, and his father felt that he needed to do something other than mess around with these uh, these planes, toys, as he called them. Um, but when the war broke out, Norman saw an opportunity and decided that he was going to head, head to France, and he did. And he had been trying to interest the French government in uh, his idea without much success. Um, however, turning to this picture on the right, these are this is three Americans, and the names on there are, are reversed. The newspaper man who wrote them down wrote them down wrong. The E. Cowden, that's, a, that's a actually above Norman Prince, so that's Norman Prince on the left. It's Elliot Cowden in the middle, and then uh, William Thaw is on the right. William Thaw was, uh, had joined the uh, Foreign Legion, and he was one of the boys that I mentioned was in Kiffin's squadron, actually. He managed to transfer himself out. Uh, and get into French aviation early in 1915. And uh, then Norman Prince showed up shortly after that and started pushing his idea. Eventually, by the end of the year, the, the French decided that uh, these three men who were, who were American pilots and had done pretty well for the French uh, uh, to that point, they would give them leave to go back to America and uh, maybe generate some positive press. Well, that's exactly what happened. Um, they came back to America and, and landed in New York, and it was big story everywhere uh, that these aviators, uh, these uh, knights of the sky, were now back in America. And America was still not in the war, so they didn't have much to talk about other than these this American angle of these boys. So that's what they did. And these, these boys were rather a big hit uh, at the end of 1915 over their, their Christmas leave. And by the time they headed back for France in January 1916, they were a big uh, a big hit. France was watching what was going on, and I think that this uh, uh, led them to believe that this might not be such a bad idea after all. And they decided to go forward and form a uh, a squadron of Americans. 
That squadron uh, was first placed in Luxeuil Le Bain in uh, in France, uh, maybe a, uh, just a short way from the the uh, border with Switzerland. A beautiful little town, uh, and the seven American boys were sent there uh, with two French commanders. This is one of my favorite photos, and it's on the, the front of my book. This is three of the of the boys that I think were really the core of this effort and uh, of the idealism that I think comes through all of them. It's Jim McConnell on the left. He was born in Chicago, uh, went to the University of, of Virginia, and made his way to France to volunteer for the ambulance corps. Uh, when uh, shortly after the war broke out, eventually decided that he he felt like a shirker and he didn't want to uh, to just volunteer in the ambulance corps, which was uh, you know the Red Cross and neutral that he wanted to uh, to get in what he called the fighting end. And so near near the same time that uh, those other boys went back to America for their Christmas leave, Jim McConnell got himself transferred into uh, aviation and became a pilot became good friends with Kiffin Rockwell as, as well. And this is a picture of them in Luke Soy shooting pole. The gentleman in the back is Victor Chapman, who was a real uh, blue blood, as a lot of these, these boys were, came from lots of money. His father was John J. Chapman, whose uh, grandfather was uh, John J., the uh, first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And John J. Chapman was a very famous essayist and author, Harvard graduate, very, very, very wealthy. Victor Chapman was wealthy in his own right. Um, when he died, they, it was said that he had a, a personal estate worth north of $500,000, which was a huge amount of money at that time. Um, but that's a picture of him. And I just, I, I love this picture of them in Luke Soy. I think it sort of captures uh, something special about the, the boys and the squadron. Um, here's a little video that I, th that I put together because as soon as the, the French got the uh, Americans together in Luxoy, they uh, sent out some propaganda uh, filmers to film some footage and, and get it back to America and to, and to use it. Propaganda, I, I say that, but it didn't have uh, the negative connotations that it sort of has now. It's more just uh, do, do what you can. And that's what, uh, that's what they did. But here's, here's some slice of that film, which was actually taken in Luke Soy in May of 1914. And you'll see each of the boys and I labeled it a little, little bit. I'll talk a little bit about each of them as we, as we make our way through. This is the entire squadron. That was Bill Thaw. Uh, I'll pause there for a second. You see Bill Thaw there with the cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> I actually, this is kind of funny. I, I tried to make an ad out of this and submit it to Facebook to, uh, to get it out there and try to sell a few copies of my book. And they rejected the ad, and I couldn't figure out why. And I finally got uh, the answer back from them. It was because it portrayed smoking. <laughs> I thought, well, good grief. I don't think you're going to find a shot of these boys where they weren't smoking. If there was one thing that these boys did, um, it was uh, smoke. And you can see that throughout, throughout this video, too. All of them were smoking. And I think it was nerves or coolness or what, but they, they, they smoked, that's for sure. That's Bill Thaw there. That's Norman Prince to his left, and that's Elliot Cowden. Um, this is uh, the three uh, pilots that had gotten sent back to, to America for Christmas leave. It's Elliot Cowden, Bill Thaw, and Norman Prince. Um, I think they took this shot just because they were officers, and they already had war medals, too, and you can see the medals on their chest. That's their two French commanders, and you'll see another shot of them here. This is Captain George Taino. Um, wrote a memoir after the war that's a very good one. Um, this is L Lieutenant Alfred Delage de Mew. All the boys loved him, and when he died, it was a very sad day for everyone. He spoke English very well and was very personable. This is Bill Thaw, um, another wealthy elite uh, American. His father was a, a tycoon from Pittsburgh. He had attended Yale. This is Elliot Cowden, a Harvard graduate. Elliot was actually the first uh, American to shoot down a plane um, in, in combat, had done it the month before the squadron formed. This is Norman Prince, looks very prestigious and, uh, and wealthy, and that's what he was. All around good, uh, good man. When he, when he signed up, this is Jim McConnell, and you can see he's kind of a jokester. But back to Prince, uh, a reporter asked him why he signed up with the French. And he said, I, I enlisted because we in America owe such a debt to France as can never be paid. 
my country may have forgotten what Lafayette and Rochambeau and all the rest did for us when we were in dire need, but some of us have not forgotten. This is Bert Hall. I'll tell you a little bit more about him. This is Kiffin Rockwell. Uh, I love this shot of him. He sort of looks like a movie star, like, and uh, that's eventually what happened with this film. It was actually turned into a movie and sent back to America. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as well. And this is Victor Chapman, uh, best friends with Kiffin, uh, the blue blood idealist, very wealthy, very generous and giving and unafraid of anything, uh, really just rushed into danger and would attack against any odds. Um, this is another shot of, uh, of Victor Chapman, and it's this shot had to have been taken sometime after June 18th because uh, on that day he was he was uh, wounded in combat, and the Americans in Luxoy had done pretty well. Kiffin shot down a German, and it was the first victory for the uh, for the squadron and became uh, renowned worldwide. Everybody was talking about it. It was a it was a very big deal and made the squadron famous and made uh, Kiffin famous. They were then transferred to Verdun, where the uh, Battle of Verdun was still going on. France making its heroic stand against the, the Germans, and these boys were tasked with flying over uh, Verdun. Um, Victor Chapman uh, went up on uh, June 7th. Well, let me back up a little bit. Elliot Cowden had gotten into a little bit of an argument with Victor Chapman. I told you that he would rush into danger, and he would. and. Uh, Elliot Cowden actually said to him, uh, you know, you ought to get fitted for a, a coffin. You, you take so many chances. Well, sure enough, on June, on June 17th, uh, Victor Chapman got into a battle, which was likely with Oswald Bulky, the uh, famous German ace. Um, nearly got killed. And you can see he actually got, got scraped on the head by a bullet and had to have uh, himself all bandaged up there after that. Still didn't want to stop, and uh, Taino actually convinced him to stop by saying he would give him a, a more powerful plane. During that time, uh, his uncle came to visit the squadron, and uh, Victor actually said in sort of an offhand way, of course I shall never come out of this alive. Uh, and that's how many of the boys felt, and uh, it's, it's more remarkable to know that they sort of assumed that they would die for France, but that was okay with them. They felt like they were repaying this debt. Well, the day after Chapman got wounded, another pilot named uh, uh, Clyde Balsley, who's from Texas and had just joined the squadron, got, uh, sh got shot down and wounded through the hip. He was in the hospital and, and Victor decided that he would go over and visit. And uh, Clyde asked him to bring him some oranges. Well, on June 23rd, Victor took off with a basket of oranges to take to Clyde Balsley saw some planes and thought that he would rush to help his uh, comrades in combat, but none of his comrades knew he was coming and they left because they were outnumbered. And that was just when Victor Chapman showed up and uh, got shot down by the Germans. So he was the first American pilot to, to go down in France, made worldwide news, headlines everywhere, was a big deal. And uh, they had a big ceremony for him on the 4th of July in Paris. The day after that uh, in America, they released that movie which had been made from the footage, which I showed you just a second ago of the boys. They called that movie, Our, Our uh, American Boys in the European War. And it made its way all around the East Coast through uh, a lot of uh, um, estates and, and homes sponsored by uh, uh, elite wealthy families that they would sponsor the movie and do showings of it and raise money for the war effort. Um, the tide was slowly turning in America, and, and a lot of the publicity from these boys was helping to turn the tide in favor of intervention on behalf of France, and Victor Chapman's death was a big story on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, they continued fighting through, through the summer, Kiffin and the rest of the boys doing the, uh, their level best. Kiffin would win three more confirmed victories. Uh, he flew more hours over the front than any other pilot in the entire French service in July, and the squadron as a whole put up good numbers um, and was one of the most utilized squadrons uh, that, that summer. Um, they were transferred back to Luxoy in September, and a few days later on September 23rd, Kiffin went up uh, to uh, see what he could see and uh, unfortunately was, was shot down. This is a picture of uh, his brother Paul at the, the site where he was shot down. 
and the uh, the picture certainly certainly speaks a thousand words here. You can you can see the the grief and the anguish in in, uh, in Paul, and he was uh, devastated. The uh, he, he actually um, would write later on no one ever had a dearer brother and truer friend than i had and when kiffin fell something went out of my life that can never return in this world but kiffin went so bravely and so willingly for what he knew to be right that i can only attempt to bear his loss with a courage worthy of him his life was full of fine deeds if not of long years and since fate willed that he die young i am glad that it was fighting for france and humanity that he met his death well, they had the funeral there in Luxoy. Kiffin is buried there in Luxoy under the flags of both Fran uh, France and America. And it's a very uh, uh, neat uh, scene there. And they, they still honor him in, in France. Word of Kiffin's death came back to Paris. You know, that's where Paul was. And it came uh, to Mrs. Weeks, who was, of course, devastated. She wrote to her brother in, in America, the blow has fallen again and Kiffin has gone. Lieutenant Thaw came for me. We had to find Paul to tell him and well, what can I say? Um, again, you can just hear the anguish in, in her voice as well. Well, more Americans kept coming and there were uh, plenty of replacement pilots and they were needed. Eventually, um, several of the boys would die, including Jim McConnell and Norman Prince. And each time it was, uh, it was big news. But when Kiffin died there in September, it was uh, made headlines uh, ar around the world. Um, Germany was intent on uh, resuming submarine warfare, which it had agreed to revoke as part of the Sussex Pledge. The Sussex was a, a, a ship that had been sunk in, uh, I believe, around March of 1916. And Germany agreed after that that they wouldn't sink passenger vessels without giving them a chance to, uh, to transfer to another vessel and get everybody off. Um, but they had so many in Germany had long since come to the conclusion that they needed to sink everybody because uh, America uh, was supplying France and uh, and England, and they thought thought that was their only chance. So they seized on Kiffin, Kiffin's death, got news of his death past the uh, the censors in the Foreign Office in Berlin, and everywhere in Berlin they were talking about the death of Kiffin Rockwell, and it created a big uh, a firestorm of controversy. In fact, the uh, acting ambassador at that time wrote back uh, home to uh, President Wilson and his superiors that uh, that th th this may end up uh, uh, causing Germany to um, to revoke their pledge not to engage in submarine warfare, and we're really going to be in it. Eventually, it did, and uh, America entered the war in April of 1917 shortly after Jim McConnell had been shot down. Um, I told you I would come back to the flag, and this was the, the flag that uh, all those boys had carried down the uh, Avenue de la Opera that Rene Felizo wore around his waist. All the boys had signed it, including Kiffin and Paul. The, the American volunteers signed it uh, when they had first uh, reached their training in Ruin. And so on September 1st, 1914, they all signed it. And this is a picture of it signed. It's all faded since then. Um, but it is uh, on display in, in Paris in the uh, Museum uh, de la Invalides. And I'll tell you how that came to be. Um, um, after America entered the war in April of 1917, uh, Troops started arriving in France in numbers in uh, June of 1917. And on the 4th of July, uh, the grateful nation of France decided to extend its official welcome and welcome uh, General Pershing to, uh, to France. The uh, reverend from the American church in Paris had, had been given that flag that the boys had signed and that they had, uh, that Felizo had died uh, under and had, it was now returned back to uh, General Pershing, and it was presented by uh, this reverend in Paris from the American church. And he, he said this to uh, General Pershing that day as he handed him the flag. It is my privilege, General, as representing our American legionnaires, those Americans who, for the love of France and of liberty, entered the French army in 1914 
to present to France this flag, their flag and our flag. They were the pioneers of that great American army which is coming following your lead as their general. And now they, the advance guard, are leaving to you and to your troops the task which they began so bravely. Now your new standard will replace their bullet-pierced flag, whilst theirs is confided to France, whom they loved with deathless eagerness, and it will be guarded forever in that shrine of the nation, the Musée des Invalides. Well, it was a very touching scene, and Pershing himself wrote about it later, as did several of the French generals. Um, but one more visit was needed to make this day complete, the 4th of July in, 19, in Paris in 1917. The American troops that were assembled there marched out of the uh, Invalides behind uh, the French troops, and they marched all through Paris to the tomb of Lafayette. Hundreds of thousands of cheering Parisians uh, filled the sidewalks uh, along this entire route. Um, all the vantage points were densely packed with men and women and children. People were watching from windows and balconies and rooftops as the columns of uh, Americans made their way through the city. Uh, many of the citizens were running forward to shake hands or to toss flowers or just march with the troops. One letter home that I, that I found from one of the soldiers who was there in Paris that day wrote this to his mother. I never saw such a demonstration. Everywhere were American flags. Paris was wild, frantic. I never saw anything like it. They are crazy over the Americans. Viva l'Amérique seems to be still buzzing in my ears. I can't begin to describe the wonderful effect our declaration of war has had on the French. It has given them new courage. We came in at the psychological moment. France weeps for happiness, cheers for joy, rekindles her spirit and cries, Viva l'Amérique. Um, long live America, obviously, but that's a, a touching tribute to what it must have looked and felt like that day. There is some footage uh, of that day, and I encourage you to, to look at it. Um, but I'll close with this, because they eventually made it to the tomb of Lafayette. Uh, they have uh, set up with the French dignitaries and General Pershing and his uh, aide, Colonel Charles E. Stanton, to whom uh, General Pershing had uh, delegated the task of speaking. Well, uh, Charles Stanton stepped before the crowd and speaking in English, uh, closed his, uh, his short speech with, with, this, uh, with these uh, sentences. America has joined forces with the Allied powers, and what we have of blood and treasure are yours. Therefore, it is with loving pride we drape the colors in tribute of respect to the citizen of your great republic. And here and now, in the shadow of the illustrious dead, we pledge our heart and our honor in carrying this war to successful issue. Lafayette, we are here. And that became sort of a famous rallying cry and, and has uh, long withstood as a uh, remembrance of World War I. But I think, uh, I hope that my book goes some distance in telling the story that led up to that moment and how these Americans who were already there when they weren't obligated to be there, there was no, no draft, that they, they weren't under any obligation. America was not in the war and they were there to fight for the principle uh, and their ideals and the principle that America owed something to France and that we owed something because of the actions of France and, and her sons when America uh, really needed it. So I really love uh, the idea, and I think that every American should be aware of the full story of these boys who remembered Lafayette, and they gave their principles and their lives and everything they had uh, for, for those principles and were willing to do so, to, to repay this, this debt. I believe that they uh, helped in a pretty uh, important way to prepare the way for America to enter World War I. They prepared the American mind to be ready to go to war. Um, and that's ultimately what happened. Um, I think one, one of, the, of those who knew the, the boys well wrote later on that they are not dead. Their spirits still live, inviting us to higher ideals, nobler aspirations, and unwavering patriotism. And I agree with that. I hope my book has told their story in a manner worthy of, of their story. And I'll close with this quote from uh, a doctor, an American doctor in Paris who helped very much with, with the effort. His name was Edmund Gross. And he wrote a year after the war ended, he wrote a letter to John J. Chapman, the father of Victor Chapman. And he said this, the splendid heroism and sacrifice of these young men who came as volunteers 
when nothing forced them to enter the strife should never be forgotten. And in my opinion, it is our duty to do all that will fix their names on the tablets of time. And I hope that my book has gone some distance in doing that. And I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this presentation. I hope you've learned a, a little bit about these, uh, these boys who remembered Lafayette and that you feel a sense of pride in what they did and the sacrifice that they made uh, so that uh, France could be saved. Because I think in some sense they were um, paying a debt and they were uh, saving civilization. And I'll end there. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mark. That was a terrific presentation. I think we've all really enjoyed having the opportunity to look uh, somewhat more in depth at the individuals that, that made up the squadron. Um, while we wait for folks to enter their questions into the question window, um, which folks, if you have questions, please do do that. I will uh, share them with our speaker this evening and give him the opportunity to answer them. Um, Mark, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about where we can procure said book. Sure. Thank, th thank you. Um, yeah, you can you can get it at the major sellers. It's available on Amazon. Uh, it's available on Barnes and Noble. I think Thrift Books. Uh, this website that I put up here at the end, this Undying Greatness. This is a website that I put together. Um, you can order the book there direct from me if you want to. I could sign a copy or something for you. Um, but I also put on there some uh, on this UndyingGreatness.com. There are some. Uh, links to like press about the book there's links to uh, what i call the extras and it tells a little bit more about the boys has a few pictures of like jim mcconnell and victor chapman alan seeger i link to a, a nice reading of alan seeger's poem i have a rendezvous with death i link to some of the music that the boys listened to during that time when they were in france i found some of that they had an old phonograph that uh Norman Prince's uncle brought out to them and they talked about some of the records that they used to listen to. Um, and there's some footage, you know, I talked uh, that footage that I showed you that's from uh, the, the uh, uh, photographs and movies taken in Luke Soy, that's, that's linked on there. There's some footage uh, of the parade through Paris on the 4th of July of 1917. So you can see that. And um, there's, Let's see, there's one other thing. Um, anyway, ch ch check out undyinggreatness.com and you'll see a bunch of uh, extra things that can help you. Even as you're reading the book, you can sort of help you absorb into it a little bit more and feel uh, these boys and their time and their place. It's great that you created a resource that gives people the opportunity to kind of augment that that reading experience of the book. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions here. Um, what was the lingua franca within the squadron? Uh, was everyone speaking French all the time, or once it was assembled as an American unit, did people revert to English? Yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, so the, yeah, there were there were seven Americans, and then the officers were both French. Uh, both the officers spoke English, and, and all the boys said that uh, Lieutenant uh, uh, Delage de la Mew uh, spoke English very well. Apparently, Taino spoke it pretty well, too, but they had a system that they set up. I can't remember which way it went, but they, they uh, flipped and flopped back and forth and said that they would speak, you know, like uh, French during the, the, the day, and then... Uh, English at mealtime and then or, or maybe it went the other way that it was English during the day and then French at mealtime and they set up a little system where they would fine you uh, if you if you spoke uh, um, French when you were supposed to be speaking English or English when you were speaking French when you're supposed to be speaking French and they would put all the money in this uh, in this little kitty that would then be used to uh, purchase wine and uh, and food and that sort of a a, a mess uh, uh, pot for for the boys so that they spoke English and French and most of the boys uh, there learned at least some French. Uh, Bill Thaw spoke French, Norman Prince spoke French pretty well and uh, the other boys all, all learned it to varying degrees and so they, they at least understood what was going on. Kiffin had started learning French in the in the trenches um, and uh, some of the other boys uh, learned it while they were there, but some of them already knew it, like like Norman Prince spoke it pretty well before he ever got there. 
Interesting. So the basically the equivalent of a modern swear jar being used back then. Um, you <laughs> yeah, mentioned right. you mentioned that uh, they that they would save up said you know mess dollars towards alcohol and and you had mentioned earlier that they're smoking in pretty much every you know photo or video that can be found. Um, drinking seems to have been prolific as well. Can you maybe speak to the reasons for the drinking? Um, and and what effect that had on them and their in, in terms of readiness and their their flying ability sure um there certainly was drinking i think the the lafayette escadrille see so when the squadron first started there in luxoy in april um it was known as n124 which stood for newport and they were the first squadron that flew all newports they flew this uh, this bay bay and uh, the, the, it was the small, light, you know, Newport 11, uh, the first, uh, like, fighter plane, really. And these boys were all given that, and it was a big honor. Um, certainly, planes changed a lot, you know, there, thereafter very rapidly. But this was a big honor at the time. And um, they, they were the first fighter pilots, and that put them in a spot where, you know, this whole new uh, uh, area of combat was opening up. And the stress was certainly there and they're flying high in the sky and it's a big strain on their body. They were going up several times a day initially and it just sort of wore them out. And then under the stress they were under, they, um, yeah, the, some, of, some of them drank and there certainly was some there early on when the squadron was known just as N124 or the Escadrille American, it was, it was informally called. It later became the Lafayette Escadrille, um, but not until after Kiffin had already died and Norman Prince had actually died as well. It was shortly after uh, President Wilson was reelected in November of 1916, and largely as a result of the outcry of Kiffin Rockwell's death uh, in September. Uh, remember I told you that his death had gotten past the censors at the foreign office in, uh, in Berlin. It had been worldwide news and all the German papers were complaining that, hey, everybody knows that there are these American boys in France fighting for France, and you're you're as a country you're going to pretend that you're neutral, and everybody knows that you're not. And uh, so they filed some formal complaints, and America came to France and said, eh, "Can you tone it down on the Escadrille American?" So they actually changed the name to the uh, Volunteer Squadron. And nobody liked that. And then it was Dr. Gross who at least claimed credit for uh, coming up with the name, um, the uh, Lafayette Escadrille. And, and that, that took effect shortly thereafter at the end of 1916. But Kiffin and Victor and Norman were already dead by that time. Um, but certainly the, the Lafayette Escadrille really got a reputation for drinking um, later on. Um, mostly that came after these boys, but certainly some of the boys drank uh, and drank to excess. Jim McConnell would never turn down a, a drink and was known for for um, for his part. And a couple boys that joined shortly after uh, they arrived in Verdun were uh, known to drink quite a bit. Um, Rumsey and uh, Johnson, shoot, shoot Johnson. And Rumsey, they always called him rum and he actually put rum on the side of his uh, of his plane. He was another, uh, Lawrence Rumsey was another um, Harvard graduate, but a, a big drinker. And there's some discussion of drinking in, in their letters, but some of the early boys, Kiffin included, really frowned on the reputation that some of the Americans were getting for drinking and sort of looked down on it as like, hey, these guys are gonna wreck our reputation here going all over Paris and, and getting, getting drunk. Of course, they did that some on their own, and they all uh, made it clear. But I think maybe some of the other um, pilots really let it get out of hand. Probably, particularly Lawrence Rumsey uh, and Johnson. Bert Hall, for one, said that he would never touch liquor, and some of the other uh, boys wrote that he would never touch liquor because he was afraid of getting drunk and telling what his real name was. <laughs> they sort of looked down on him. Some of them, anyway. Kiffin was friends with him, and Bill Thaw was very good friends with him. But some of the others viewed him as as uh, um, an interloper. He he was not like us. He he was sort of a hard scrabble Missouri ruffian who made his way as best as he could, and you know cheated at cards and uh, wrote bad checks and things like this. But the uh, um, most of the boys got along with him, particularly Kiffin and Bill, because they had served in the trenches with him as well. But some of the others really didn't like him, and he eventually was sort of forced out of the out of the squadron. And he was uh, he was maybe not uh, 
you know, the ideal guy that you would want to hold up as the poster boy or whatever, but in a pinch, he, he, he did well. And he shot down planes and um, Jim McConnell said that he, he really felt that in a pinch that Burt Hall would, would uh, stand up and, and be counted. And he was, um, he, he, he was, I think he gets a little bit of a bad rap. Um, but back to your original question about drinking. Yes, there was drinking. Uh, it it uh, certainly in some instances probably got out of hand. There's some there's some uh, accounts of that later on. But during this time, Kiffin in particular was really not uh, intent on drinking, certainly at the front, um, because he was all go, 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 you know, an idealism. Certainly after Victor Chapman got killed, he really poured himself into trying to uh, get some Germans to uh, avenge his best friend's death. Um, he sort of wore himself out, and you can see from the pictures, if you look at the pictures of Kiffin and, and some of the others, they really aged, and Kiffin definitely did uh, by the time he died in September. hope that answers the, the question at least a little bit. Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, you may have hit on partially the next question as well, which is um, there are the, the French Foreign Legion isn't always cast as being filled with uh, aspirational idealists. It's uh, oftentimes, you know, kind of shown as a, a place where some ne'er-do-wells end up. Uh, was there was there any sense of that that kind of Im imbued Kiffin's original unit that he was part of when he was over there? Um, and did any of that later translate over to the squadron itself? Um, maybe, maybe not so much translated into the squadron, although there was a little bit of uh, some dust ups between the, the boys, as you could imagine, between fighter pilots and uh, the competitive nature. Um, there were certainly some dust ups, but I'll circle back to that. As far as the, the foreign legion, yeah, there was. I mean, with these, these Americans, and remember, uh, several of them had you know, lots of money. Victor Chapman w was one, and he came over. He was with his parents in London when the war started and came over and signed up and, and uh, ended up in a different squadron than Kiffin, but he was a millionaire. Same with uh, Bill Thaw. Some of these guys had big money and were completely different from your typical uh, legionnaire. Uh, a lot of these guys had signed up to get in under a different name or to run from the police or crimes that they had committed or to start a new life. And you really see this when what they call the anciens, the, uh, the veterans, came from Northern Africa uh, shortly after the, the war had started. And all the Americans wrote about it in their diaries and letters when they were in Toulouse and, and uh, they, they were still undergoing their training. And about two weeks in, uh, there's a bugle call and here come all these uh, veterans marching in. And they all wrote about how impressive it was. And they had these shining uniforms and and their bayonets gleaming and everything polished. And boy, these guys knew their stuff. And they did, but they also knew how to, uh, how to uh, manipulate the, the Americans. And so some of the Americans would say, hey, this guy stole my stuff every day for a week. And they'd steal it and sell it back. And, uh, and uh, so there was a little bit of a culture clash there between a lot of these Americans and then a lot of these other uh, veteran legionnaires. That's what eventually led to the death of Rene Felizo. Remember I said that he got into a fight uh, in March of 1915 and got clubbed over the head with a big uh, container of wine and eventually died because his skull had been fractured. Well, that's how it happened. Some of these uh, 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 veterans had commented about, uh, and this was shortly after the first American died. Um, he, he died, Edward Stone, who was from Chicago, died in February of uh, 1915 and had been part of a machine gun unit there in the uh, Foreign Legion. And some of those machine gunners were talking to, making uh, fun of the other Americans and saying, you guys, uh, uh, you know, any, any one of us could take any uh, uh, more than one of, of you, any group of you. And fellows though finally had enough and said, uh, I'll, I'll prove to you that that's not true. And he started fighting and he was fighting two of these guys at once and winning. And that's when the third, um, a veteran came up from behind and, and unsuspecting, blasted him over the head with a bottle of wine, and, and that's how Felizo died. So certainly there was lots of friction in the Legion between uh, the Americans and, these, uh, and, and some of these other soldiers who were much different from the Americans. As far as that exact animosity carrying over to the uh, squadron, 
I don't think so, but there was animosity in the squadron. A lot of people say that Kiffin and Norman Prince didn't get along, and they certainly had their run-ins, but I think it's a, a little more overblown than, I, I believe it to be a little more overblown. I think Kiffin and, and Prince uh, were on the same side all along, even when they had their run-ins. There was, there was some uh, remarks that Kiffin made, even about Captain uh, Taino, when uh, Kiffin didn't get the recognition that he felt that he had earned, uh, and that Taino was sort of favoring um, the, the, the French side of things because, uh, you know, uh, Raoul Loughberry, who became a very famous pilot and was uh, um, technically uh, uh, American, he had been born in France and raised in France and, uh, and spoke French fluently. And, and Kiffin got the idea that uh, Taino sort of favored him a little bit. At least he didn't question his claims like he did others. And uh, that sort of rubbed him the wrong way. And so there was some friction there between the Americans and their commanders, but nothing like what was exhibited between the uh, veterans and what they called the blues, the rookies in the, in the foreign legion. But that's a good question. There, there certainly was, even on the same side, there were, there was friction and uh, it, uh, it, 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 it did play a role here. And it certainly, it cost Rene Felizel his, his life. It's it's definitely tragic to see what what happens, you know, there in the trenches or while soldiers are waiting to go into combat. Um, you mentioned that the, there were French officers attached to the squadron while the bulk of the pilots themselves were were Americans um, with, you know, varying degrees of complexity in terms of the way in which they were American. Um, can you speak to the ranks of the American pilots? Were they enlisted men? Were they non-commissioned officers? How did they kind of fit into the rank structure and hierarchy of the French army as a whole? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, they, they did, uh, all of them had enlisted and uh, at the beginning of the war, you know, Bill Thaw was already a pilot. He had learned to, to fly and dropped out of Yale so that he could go uh, fly a uh, hydro airplane around. When the war broke out, he was actually over in France. Um, uh, he, he had gone over to enter a, a flight contest that was going on in France in 1914, stayed in Paris, and then when the war broke out, he offered his plane and his services to, to the French government, and they said, well, we'll take your plane, but we, we have more people that want to be pilots than we know what to do with, so no thanks. He enlisted as a, as a regular common soldier in the Foreign Legion and ended up in the same squadron as, as Kiffin. Um, Kiffin and Paul obviously enlisted. Bert Hall enlisted. Um, even when Norman Prince came over and was allowed to get into aviation, they were uh, just, you know, privates. They, they were regular common soldiers. He and Bill, Norman Prince and Bill Thaw and Elliot Cowden had all advanced um, in degree, I think up to sergeant at least, and uh, Thaw went up to um, lieutenant quickly. He made a couple big leaps um, because of some, uh, bombing missions that he flew in May of 1915. And um, and Norman Prince and Elliot Cowden had also won medals, and so they were bumped up as well. But when the squadron was formed in uh, in April of 1916, the captain was Taino. His, uh, there's actually some indication in the letters, particularly from Victor Chapman, that uh, uh, there was going to be some disappointment from Bill Thaw because he thought that he would be the lieutenant and be second in command. And that's sort of what they what they anticipated. And Bill Thaw had even recommended uh, Captain Taino be the leader of the unit. And then when he was, I think they were disappointed to learn that he brought his own lieutenant along, this Alfred Delage de Mew. The boys certainly got over it quickly and, and uh, respected Delage de Mew. Bill Thaw was sort of viewed as like a uh, a, um, a leader in fact, I guess. And he was an officer at, at the time. He, he was, he was a, uh, a lieutenant, second lieutenant at least. And um, several of the boys got promotions right after they had gone to the front. Like Kiffin, when he got his victory, he was made a sergeant. Um, then uh, he, he scored several more victories and was actually had been uh, um, uh, pointed out for promotion to lieutenant uh, when he when he died. He died before that that came through. Um, but all the other boys had had all enlisted and just and just worked their way up, um, in, including uh, Jim McConnell and um, 
who am I forgetting here? Prince, Chapman, Thaw, um, Elliot Cowden, they all began as, uh, as common soldiers and then worked their way up. Mark, uh, you, you mentioned, you know, Kiffin was up for promotion at the point at which he died, and you had spoken earlier about the, um, you know, routine evolution of, or rapid evolution of military aviation at the time, and new aircraft coming on scene and so on. Um, what was Kiffin flying when he was shot down? Um, he, they had just, they were so excited when they went back to Luke Soy, um, because they had all been, when, when they were in Paris, they actually went and visited the, uh, the, the factory where they made the uh, the Newports and the Newports, as I said, had advanced rather rapidly. So the the Newport 11, the baby, had uh, had sort of revolutionized things. And then um, the newer versions, the the Newport 16 and then the Newport 17. And I think they had all been promised the Newport 17s when they went back to Luke Soy and they went to the factory to to discuss that with everybody. When they got back out to Luke Soy. I'm subject to correction on this, but I think they only had uh, two two of the planes was all that had shown up. And to show you how they ranked in sort of uh, uh, Tano's eyes, he gave those two planes, the first two, to Kiffin Rockwell and Raul Lufberry. And um, they didn't even have all the ammunition uh, for their planes when they got out there. I think they had like uh, one ammunition belt between them. Well, as soon as uh, they got that, Kiffin and, and Lufberry went up and Kiffin wanted to go up to try out his new plane. And these these planes had um, the, 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 the prior version of the Newport just had the, um, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the, of the gun, but it was situated above the, uh, the wing so that it wouldn't uh, shoot off the propeller. Technology had also advanced rapidly this way and now they had uh, uh, following the, uh, the Fokker uh, they had come up with a, a their own version that shot through the, uh, the through the propeller. So this new plane that Kiffin had had a had a machine gun that shot through the propeller, and it also had the uh, the uh, gun that was over the the wing. So he was very excited to go out. But I think that those were the only two planes that they had that of, of the new ones, uh, the Newport 17s. The rest would show up. Uh, shortly thereafter, but a lot of the boys wrote about how they were so frustrated after Kiffin died that because they couldn't even go up and avenge his death. They didn't have their planes and they didn't have any ammunition and this was just an awful thing for them to, to deal with. In fact, um, uh, Luffberry went up on his own the day after Kiffin died and the day, uh, the, the next day, which was his funeral. Funeral started at 10 a.m. and Luffberry went up before that to see if he could uh, find some Germans. He didn't, but that's how uh, how much he respected Kiffin was he wanted to avenge his death. Staying on the subject of Kiffin's death for for another couple of questions, um, there is a marker at their family plot uh, for Kiffin, but he is his grave is actually in France. Uh, was there ever a discussion about bringing him back to the United States by the family? I think that there was. Um, I think that they had uh, considered that for some time and then and then backed off of it. Some of the other boys actually were brought home as well. You see, uh, there, there is a big memorial over there outside of uh, Versailles that's a wonderful memorial and was just restored a couple of years ago. And it's just uh, uh, almost unbelievable when you see it. It's just fantastic. Um, and it has uh, like a, a tomb there for everybody and it has their names, but many of them are not there. Um, Kiffin, for one, he's buried in Luke Soy, as I said. Norman Prince ended up, his family did bring his remains uh, back, and he's actually um, buried in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and they have a little shrine to him there, um, which is pretty cool. As far as um, Kiffin coming home, I think originally they intended that. I know at least Paul intended to, to have his grave be um, where he was shot down, which was a uh, little ways outside of Luxoy, but it just never happened. And I think, uh, you know, his mother came over to France the year after the, the war ended and they visited his grave and any ideas that they had of, of moving him, I think they just decided, no, we're just leaving him here. And that's where he's been uh, ever since. 
Um, breaking away from the subject of his passing, um, in the images you know taken before his death, as compared to those you showed us earlier in the presentation, um, it's it's obvious that flying t had taken its toll physically, mentally. Um, you can kind of see that in the images. Um, were they themselves aware of the toll being taken on them? Did they know how how much you know the rigors of flying and and being over the battlefield had had taken its toll on them? I think so. Um, they may not have have, have uh, glimpsed it as much as uh, you know an objective outside observer, but uh, certainly they that they were aware. Kiffin wrote in some of his letters about the toll that it was taking on him and how he he said something about you know this constant going up and down and and remember the temperatures up there are freezing. These guys had to wear fur coats even in the summertime to get up at the heights that they were um, that that they were flying. And uh, Kiffin would write in his letters, not in a complaining way, but just in a, in a matter of fact, like, hey, gee, this is, you know, this really wears you down, this constant up and down and, and being ready. And, and um, Jim McConnell wrote, I'll see if I can find it here real quick. Um, he was writing a letter uh, to uh, Mrs. Weeks, I think, or to his, his friend in Paris, and just wrote about how Boy, it really wears on you this idea of uh, of that when you anytime you go up, you might uh, you might not come back. I'm seeing if I can fight the yeah. And when when he was writing, and as he was writing the letter, he wrote about how um, some of the others had had not returned yet. And then he you can see that during as he's writing the letters that he he must have learned more. And he writes at the end of his uh, letter, um, well, th they tell him, he, he wrote in his letter that someone had told him about a French pilot that had been, that had collided with a Fokker and had killed both of them. And he wrote in his letter, funny life this, you sit around comfortably and wait for your flights and you don't know whether you will come back or not. And they, they said it in sort of matter of fact tones like that. And many of them just assumed that they, you know, eventually they would not come back. And that was okay for them. And that's what I think makes them all the more remarkable is they they, they did know a slash assume that they were going to um, ultimately be sacrificed and they were okay with it. But um, they, they did write it in offhand ways like that. Uh, and I think that some of their partying was was based on that, you know, when they would drink in, in Paris or try to let off some steam, as it were, it's hard to imagine the, the pressure that they were under. And um, they they must have known that. In fact, shortly before they were sent to Luxoy, before Kiffin died, uh, the entire squadron was in Paris at the same time. Captain Taino arranged for them all to have leave, and they um, bought a lion cub that they named Whiskey. <laughs> so that gives you a little hint as to sort of what, what was going on there. Um, they eventually got another lion that they named Soda as well, but that was later on. So I do think they were aware. I don't think that they were um, dwelling on it, but uh, as you pointed out, you can certainly see it in the photographs. There's one photograph that I include in the book that I note that uh, it's a picture that was taken of Kiffin by his brother Paul in Paris uh, when when they when he showed up uh, just less than a month before his his death, and I note that he's just sort of staring ahead, and his 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 fist looks almost like it's involuntarily clenched and yet to me you can almost just see the the stress the sort of fatigue the the um i don't know the sacrifice that he was putting in um that picture's in the book and i think it's a good one but um your point's well taken i think these boys were worn out uh by their service so we've got a, just two more questions um one it kind of flows on from what you were just saying whatever became of whiskey and soda um, whiskey and soda. Let's see. I'm going I'm to get the facts a little bit wrong on this. So I'm subject to, to correction. One of them actually, remember I told you one of the partiers was Lawrence Rumsey. And uh, again, maybe this goes to some of the stress that they were under. I think, uh, I just don't remember if it was whiskey or soda. Gosh, it's, it's just slipping my mind at the moment. But one of the, the, the lion chewed up his hat and he came in and, and presumably he was half drunk or half in the bag and got upset and he actually hit the lion over the head with a with a stick 
and blinded the lion in one of its eyes. And you can see in some of the photos, you can see the, the damage to the, to the lion's eye. Um, I think whiskey was, uh, was the more um, aggressive or, or uh, more friendly of, of the two. And soda, the female one that they got for whiskey was, uh, was not as, uh, as friendly. They eventually got separated, and and when the Americans uh, went into were incorporated into American service, there is a story out there. I can't remember if it's um, gosh, it's a, it's again slipping my mind. I hate showing my uh, my ignorance on this, but I did know it at one point. Taino and or Luf, Lufberry, I think one of them got stuck in the zoo. I think it must have been whiskey. Got put in the zoo in Paris, and. Um, uh, later on, there was a story about it, how I think it must have been uh, Luffberry must have stopped by to visit, or maybe it was Taino later on. And anyway, the lion recognized him and came right up to the bars of the cage and was jumping on him and, and licking on him. And and uh, everybody thought, wow, that's that's pretty incredible. But uh, they, they did, uh, I think that they both end, ended up dying, one of them before the zoo and the other one uh, after the, the zoo. Um, but one was there for a little bit of time. I just don't remember which which was which, whiskey or soda. They're probably not the easiest pets to uh, keep corralled around an airfield. Um, <laughs> our, our last question for the evening um, relates to the, the boyhood home of Paul and Kiffin that is in Asheville, North Carolina. Evidently, the, the home still stands. Uh, the Carolina's Aviation Museum has a collection of artifacts and so on. Um, attached to to the Rockwell family. Um, have you ever had the opportunity to visit Asheville? Um, is there is there a kind of a strong local connection to the Rockwells? I know that there is and it's a shame because I used to live in Greenville, South Carolina and we went up to Asheville several times because one of my friends lived there but I never paid too much attention to it. Like I, like I said, um, I knew that Kiffin was from there um, but it, uh, and I had done a little bit of uh, research and read his letters and things like that, the letters that his brother Paul published. Um, but I never paid too much attention to it until my my son was born and we named him Kiffin and that sort of rekindled my interest in him and I started doing all this research and by then we had long since moved away from Greenville and I didn't have access to Asheville anymore and I kind of kicked myself. But I do know that his home still stands there. I, I understood that some lawyer, I think, owned it uh, a while back. And uh, but he lived in a couple different places there. They had a place um, on Church Street, I know, and then they moved into that home uh, after his mother uh, got some uh, some money, moved more into the up, upper middle class. She uh, I mentioned that his father was a preacher when he died. She was left to raise uh, Paul and Agnes, their sister, and Kiffin on her own. She actually went to uh, osteopath school out in Kirksville, Missouri, and uh, had arranged to work in Asheville upon her graduation. And they moved there when she graduated from, uh, from medical school. And I think she was the first female osteopath in North Carolina and set up a practice there in Asheville and started making some money. And that's when they moved into that nicer home. Still, I've, some people would maybe characterize Kiffin as coming from money, but uh, you can tell from his letters that that he that that's not the case. They certainly weren't wanting like a lot of people were, and Kiffin did whatever he could to help those around him. He was very generous, but he was nowhere near the other boys, Norman Prince and Bill Thaw and Elliot Cowden and Victor Chapman. They came from real money, blue blood money, and that was not uh, Kiffin's situation. I do think that uh, Asheville, they have the, the, I think their foreign legion post there is, uh, or the American legion post is, is named uh, after Kiffin Rockwell. And I know they have a marker there that, uh, that tells where, where he was born. I've never been to that home. I'd like to go out there again sometime and do it, but I've never, never been able to make it. I did get some research uh, on his family and things because a lot of my book, if, you, if any of you actually buy my book, hang with it because the first 70 or 80 pages are about Kiffin's family and background and ancestry and working his way through school at Washington and Lee and VMI and all this kind of stuff. World War I doesn't come about till, I don't know, probably closer to page 100. I hope that you don't get bored with that because I really felt like I owed it to Kiffin to include um, this genealogical sort of aspect and where he came from because 
I think that if you learn about his ancestor, you'll see that what he did was actually in line with what his ancestors did. They all uh, were willing to stand for principles and do what they thought was right. Um, and Kiffin did that. And that's why I, I named the book after that quote from his father, A Destiny of Undying Greatness. I think that he came from principled idealistic folks and uh, what he did was not uh, out of keeping with what with what they had done. Well, Mark, uh, that was our last question for this evening. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you for the effort that you've put into researching the, the Rockwell family and for assembling this incredible history. I know that there will be, you know, some of you out there that, that will take Mark up on his offer to purchase the book and to, to have it signed and sent back to you. Uh, again, visit uh, visit him at www.undyinggreatness.com uh, for just all of the incredible resources he's list listed off this evening. Mark, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it.